Hebrews chapter 3. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to have the opportunity to preach. Um, I do not anticipate on being long today. Number one, I never usually am. And number two, it's, as we stated earlier, about 150 degrees in here, which is really weird because Brother Goo turned on the air conditioning at like 11 o'clock this morning, and it's been running all day, and I don't know what's going on. It still seems like we are kind of short-circuiting here. I came up like at 1 o'clock this afternoon, and it was about as cold as an icebox. It felt great. And now, uh, clearly, the ice is melted. So, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 3. Uh, I just want to preach a simple message that has been a very encouraging message uh, towards me as I've been doing the study on what to preach tonight in place for Pastor Price. And um, something very simple, nothing new, um, something that everyone has heard before, yet it's been absolutely encouraging. And so, let's take time um, and pray. And then we'll go ahead and get started. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for everything uh, that you've done in our lives. And God, I pray, Lord, as uh, you give me the opportunity, Lord, to preach, I pray that, Lord, I don't say anything that you don't want me to say. Just hide me behind your cross. And to me, of myself, and fill me with your spirit, the Lord, in the next few minutes as we look at a simple uh, passage of scripture, that you will help me to preach what thus saith the Lord. Be with Pastor Price and Mrs. Price as they're gone. And for those who aren't here, I pray that you'll bless them. And help them, uh, if they're coming tonight, to come soon. If not, we'll see them Sunday. We love you and we praise you in your name. Amen. I just want to, before I really delve in, dive into what we're going to be preaching, I just want to uh, thank everybody for just being a remarkable friend to me and being super encouraging to me just in the past uh, 25 or so months that I've been down here at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. But one of the interesting people that I've met in just the past year it's the gentleman in the purple shirt in the middle, Mr. Goo. Uh, he's been an absolute encouragement to me. And he's been really encouraging because one of the things that I just found out recently is he's basically like a medical, like, like a doctor basically. He's really smart on his medical things. For the past two weeks, Goo has warned me of a condition saying that I have a heart problem. Uh, I always say something sarcastic. It always comes after I say something sarcastic or rude or mean or something to belittle goo but he always just is really encouraging and says Tosh you have a heart problem and you know that makes me aware of my medical condition he even told me today as I walked straight into the door I didn't even say hi to him I just walked in and his first words were why do you hate me you have heart problem and I was like oh, yeah that's right I need to get that checked out but um yeah of course we're not talking about the actual heart that he's talking to me he's talking about the fact that I am an awful person with a terrible heart, and my motives are terrible, and I need to get my life right. So thanks, Goo. Uh, but at the same token, um, we do have a heart that we do have to be cautious or um, mindful of. And Goo didn't really know that I was anticipating on preaching this tonight when Pastor asked me to preach. But I always thought it was funny that Goo would try to poke fun at me and tell me that I have a heart problem. And, um, it just really kind of in a weird way solidified that God wanted me to talk about the heart tonight. But um, we as Christians need to be mindful of the heart that you and I have. You know, the truth of the matter is every Christian, whether it be a good Christian or not, and not even just Christian, every person has a heart. I'm not talking about the muscle that's, you know, pumping and gets blood through the, the arms and legs and all the extremities of the body. I'm talking about basically the inner core, the, the core center of a man, the core center of a person, basically essentially the, the motivator or, or the emotional drive for that particular person. And that's what we reference as a heart. When the Bible talks to us about our hearts and how we need to keep our hearts pure and how we need to uh, you know, continue to uh, make our hearts less hard or anything like that, it's not necessarily talking about, like I said, the muscle that's pumping. It's talking about the core, the, the motive, and the, the, the basically the inner man in us. And we all have a heart. And so my question to you as we look into just a little bit of a topic of the heart is how would you examine your own heart? Now that's kind of a tall feat, isn't it? It's kind of difficult because the Bible tells us that the heart is desperately wicked 
and that no man can know it. And so, if we're honest with ourselves, the way that we view ourselves, the way that we think our heart is going, realistically is probably a little off, or it's not exactly what's really going on with us. For instance, uh, I can tell you something about me, I can tell you traits about myself, I can tell you things that make me click, things that make me happy, things that make me sad, but the way I think, the way that I think I operate may be different than the way you think I operate. And it's the exact same thing. God knows our heart more than any of us can know each other's heart or even our own. And the way that we think our heart is can be completely different, if we're not truly honest with ourselves, can be completely different with how God knows what our heart is. And so the question of the matter is, how would you examine your heart? So let's say hypothetically, you can come down to a diagnosis, okay, my heart is pure, my heart is great, or my heart is a little weak, I need some strengthening. There's a diagnosis in there that some of us might be able to apply into our own lives. And the fact of the matter is, some of us might be able to say that our own heart is actually hard, or it's pretty hard, or we've grown, in essence, callous to spiritual things or to godly things. Now, I'm not necessarily pointing at somebody and saying, yeah, I know your heart and it's, it's awful and you have a callous heart, but you would know if you are starting to lose a little bit of the desire for spiritual things, you would know if you're starting to lose a little bit of that edge or that fire as what we would call it, a fire for God and just a drive and a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, you would know if you're starting to lose that. And there are ways that you start losing that, and then with those things, your heart becomes hardened or hardened towards spiritual things. And we come to Hebrews chapter 3, which is actually kind of a repetition from what we see in Psalms 95, verses 8 through 10. Uh, basically starts at verse 7, but in time's sake, um, I am going to read from verse 12. So uh, whenever you guys get a chance by yourselves, I would start reading basically just uh, Hebrews chapter 3. It kind of gives the idea of where we're going today, but for time's sake, we're just going to start at verse 12. I'm going to read three verses, go down to verse 14. So uh, Hebrews 3 verse 12, the Bible says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you in evil, and excuse me, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are partakers of Christ. If we, excuse me, we are partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So what exactly is the idea of having a hard heart? Or what is a way that we could define a heart being hard? It's very simple. It's pretty, it's pretty easy. We used the word callous earlier. That's a great definition. But one thing that I saw in study is just simply a stone. A stone heart. A uh, heart that's just full <clears throat> of, of concrete, a heart that's just 100% stone filled. Um, is it easy to bend or move or to shape a stone? Probably in particular conditions, but just in the normal flesh, no. It's not something that's easily shape-shifted or you can, you can uh, switch it around or you can make a stone look like a heart or you can make a stone look like a diamond or anything like that. A stone is a stone. It's as simple as that. It is what it is, and people use it for certain things. People use it for gravel. People use it to throw at other, other people. But the fact of the matter is a stone is a stone, and it's not something that can be moved. And when we're talking about a hard heart, when we're talking about a heart that has been hardened for the cause of Christ or for spiritual purposes, the hard heart is the idea of a heart that is very minimally moved for the cause of Christ. A heart that isn't easily affected for spiritual things or easily driven for the cause of Christ. Now, I use the word minimally because a person with a hard heart still can, number one, be saved. And I thank the Lord for that. But also, a person with a hard heart, there are remedies and there are ways to fix or to switch our hard heart. And Christian... Might I say the reason, one of the main reasons that I'm preaching is this is not because I think there's a particular person in here that has a hard heart. Rather, there are ways that if we're not careful and we're completely ign or ignorant or ignoring it, that our heart can be hardened and we can find ourselves in a very dangerous situation. So, 
the, the idea of the hard heart, the first thing I want to look at is the reason for the hard heart. The reason for a hard heart. And it's very simple, very uh, one-track answer, and it's in verse 13. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through, dece or, excuse, through the deceitfulness of sin. The reason for a hard heart is that last word that we see in verse 13. And Christian, it is about time that there are Christians in this country that call sin exactly for what it is. It's not something that's to be uh, promoted. It's not something that's to be uplifted. It's not something that's to laugh at or to joke about. Sin is sin, and sin is very serious in the eyes of God. And if sin is very serious in the eyes of God, it should be serious in our lives as well. That's right. The fact of the matter is, sin is real. Sin is Satan's weapon to get you to get away from God. And a lot of times... There are Christians that just take a nap on it. They just sleep on it. Oh, well, they'll, they'll excuse it and say, it's just a flaw of mine. Or it runs in our family. Our family does this or has this sort of an issue, and it's the same thing with me. I'm no different. I'm a grant. So that happens with me. I do it. Get over it. This is who I am. And we try to excuse our sin, and we try to make way for our sin, and rather, excuse, rather than you know, addressing it, we just continue to live it out as if it's a part of who we are. And ladies and gentlemen, as Christians, you and I are transformed with the renewing of our mind. We're different. We are set apart from what the world would have, or how the world would live, or how the world would touch or address sin. Because the fact of the matter is, Truthfully, the world doesn't even know that some of the things that they're doing is sin or is of sinful nature. But you and I have that knowledge. You and I have that uh, freedom from the bondage of sin, freedom from the bondage of, 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 of being in sin and being bonded to, to even just the, the victory of Satan himself. You and I are free of that. And because we're free of that, we have not only the right, but the obligation to live for Christ out of sin. But if we allow sin in our heart, we continue just to allow sin to take place and to have its way in our lives, the more that you add on, the further apart it becomes. Do you understand and do you recognize that sin actually can be addictive? It could be addictive. It could be just a simple way of living. And you know, we're not talking about the normal addiction that you might see on a computer screen or people smoking or drinking. I know guys who would not have a living if they didn't lie. Just simply tell lies 24-7, say one thing and completely mean another thing. I know people who make a living and a fortunate living off of just spewing lies. You probably know people like that too. A lot of them are stereotyped as salesmen. And salesmen tend to do that. Salesmen tend to stretch the truth and say, you know what? I promise you this if you just purchase my product. I would know. I've been in sales. I still sort of work in sales. I, I, I see the cliches and the caveats salespeople are going to use to just try to get the check at the end. And it's just a way of living. People will call it survival. And they wouldn't even think about telling the truth because it doesn't get them a check at the end. And these are the people that are addicted to, to telling this lie because they have a love for money, they have a love for a check, and they have a love for the things that they want to have in their, in their lives that will cost them that much. And if all they have to do is just tell one little lie for it, fine, that's not a problem. <laughs> but I, I don't meet many people who lie and say, you know what, this is wrong, um, I, this is my last lie I'm ever going to say and cut cold turkey. No, it, it goes on and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on for a while. And when we get caught into sin, it becomes an addictive and habitual nature for us to just do it again. It's already an issue with, with, with us to stay away from it because we have a sinful nature already. But when people do it, when people practice it and make it an often practice or, or frequent practice, it becomes a part of life. It becomes a part of nature. And when you have that kind of a frequent practice into your sin, the more that you step into sin, the more that you step into that repetitiveness, 
repetitiveness, the further away you're getting away from God. And that distance allows that heart to be hardened. So, you have the, you have the addictiveness of, of sin. Um, you, you have the repetition of sin. So let's go back to the lying example for a, for a second. The Bible says, thou shalt not lie. But for a person, in their mind, when they live in sin, it registers as, well, this has been my way of living for the past however long it is. Eight months, nine months, ten months, two years, six years, 14 years, 20 years, 26 years, whatever. This has been a way of living. This has been a way that I have created a living for myself. And for me to go against that would be unwise. And that's just kind of natural thinking just in general. Okay, well, I've worked 40 hours a week. I eat three meals a day, two meals a day. I get uh, six, probably five, six hour, average hours of sleep. And I'm still breathing and everything is fine. I probably shouldn't change that, quite frankly. Because that, that, that would probably throw me off. That would probably have an ill effect for me. And that's how people are going to see you when they're, when they're supposed to do right. That's what people are going to see if they're addicted to sin and they're supposed to do right. Well, this goes against everything that I've been doing for the past so and so years and so many, so many times. The fact of the matter is, if I start now, it's going to throw me off. If I start telling the truth now, it's going to throw me off. I won't get no sales. By the way, that's not true. I've gotten sales by being 100% blunt sometimes, and it's really thrown me off. But anyway, sometimes people, that has nothing to do with anything. But uh, just a little nugget for you. People respect truth tellers more than liars. But anyway, um, the fact of the matter is, they don't think that it's going to provide that way of living. And that's what happens when sin becomes addictive into our lives. When sin becomes addictive to our lives, we make excuses to get out of doing the right thing. Secondly, with the idea of sin, number one, sin is nothing to play with. And number two, don't lie to yourself. Have you even ever said, or you know someone has said, or you, you even said it yourself, you know what, I'm going to stop this sometime down the road. I'll tell you who's really common at it. I, I heard it a lot, even just in my teenage years, but teenagers in general. I, I'm going to live for Christ when I go to college. I'll live for Christ when I have a family. Uh, I'll do the spiritual things when I am when I'm grown, when I'm an adult, when I'm a CEO of a business. I'll do the right thing then. I'm just going to live in my sin right now. That's not the way how the Bible teaches us to address our sin. The Bible teaches us in Proverbs that we should just flee from it, run away from it. Does it say when? <laughs> it implies now, at this particular instance. There's a football player. Um, he's not on a football team anymore, but his name is Johnny Manziel. And uh, he was a really talented type of a football player, a really good uh, guy. Who, but or when it comes to skill-wise, he was a good guy. But he had trouble with drugs and alcohol. And he's had trouble with drugs and alcohol ever since he's been in college. And he was in college, I'd say, four or five or so years ago. And he's been in the league. He's played a little bit of national football in the National Football League. He's played a little bit of that. Right now, he's not on a team because he has domestic abuse um, uh, on, his, on his record. He has DUIs on his record. And right now, he's just not on a team. So on the 28th of June, just a few days ago, an article came out saying that Johnny Manziel vows to quit alcohol and, and drugs. Sounds good. Sounds great. I click on the article to read it. And at this point, Johnny's getting ready to, the, the report is getting ready to quote Johnny. He says, I'm just so tired of my, my dad, you know, being hurt by my actions and my girlfriend being hurt by my actions. I'm going to quit drinking and I'm going to quit smoking on the 1st of July. So there's a 72 hour period from the time that article was posted to the 1st of July where Johnny just doesn't care what happens to his dad or his girlfriend. He's just gonna drink and, and, and have those type of drugs. And I did exactly what you guys just did. I laughed. That's not the idea of fixing your issues. This is not a idea of, okay, this is a problem, so I'm gonna take care of this tomorrow. We tend to procrastinate just in general, but sin is not something to procrastinate with. The Bible tells us that we have to address it, and when sin comes, when evil uh, doers entice thee, consent thou not, and it gives us just a few verses later from that verse of Proverbs to just flee from sin. Run away from it. Don't even have a business looking at it. Run from it.
Christian, if you and I continue to play with sin, our heart will get hardened. Case closed, no questions asked. And it happens. You and I can think of it in a personal level. There might have been a time in our life, I can think of it in mine, where we were just enthralled and engulfed in sin. It's funny, when you dive into sin, something that seems so fun, you feel really lonely. Don't you? You feel like no one's really there close to you. It's the reason, the reason is you kind of quenched the spirit. You have the absence of the presence of God. God doesn't condone sin. God hates sin, and he's made it clear in his word that he does. So when we engulf sin, we do the opposite of what James tells us. When James tells us to draw an eye to God, he will draw an eye to us. But when we decide to step away from him, the opposite happens. Then there's this distance, and somehow we wonder why we don't hear God. Don't play with sin. Sin is nothing to play with, and don't lie to yourself about it. Take care of your sin issue at that particular moment. What's the result of a uh, hard heart? We already talked about it. There's separation from God. Uh, when I was a kid, when I was a young kid, I actually had, uh, I was really loud and boisterous and obnoxious and, and really goofy, which I know is really surprising to a lot of you now since I'm so calm and reserved and relaxed. But um, I, when I was like six, seven, eight, nine years old in elementary school, I always asked the same question to people. I love pleasing people. Even to this day, I like making people laugh, smile. I want people to feel joy when they're around me or whatever it is. So I'd always ask the question, hey, um, are you my friend? I was so sub sub self-conscious with how I would treat people that I didn't know if we were friends or not. So I would just ask them, hey, uh, buddy, are you my friend? Luke, are you my friend? Luke, are you my friend? Okay, good. All right. So I have one. Um, <laughs> I would just ask everybody. And people would be thrown, you know, the little kids would be thrown off by it. And like, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, awesome. And I would just ask everyone in our classroom, are you my friend? Yeah, are you my friend? Yeah. And I would have like 50 friends, and I was basically Mr. Popular in third grade, whatever that means. <laughs> uh, I, I just had like so many friends. Until the one kid that was bold enough that didn't like me just said, you know what, no. And that broke, <laughs> yeah, that would be goo. <laughs> no, that, that, that broke my heart. As a little nine-year-old, I thought my life was over. Man, I don't have him as a friend. That threw me off, and I would go home, and I would cry about it, and my stepmom and my dad at the time would be like, don't worry about that. You know, it's fine. You're nine. You're not even going to remember these kids in three or four years. And I'm like, no, no, we're going to be friends forever for all of our lives. I don't even know the elementary school I was in at the time. I don't even know where that's at now. But they were right. I, uh, I don't know who they are. But at the time, that was really painful. That kind of stops right around middle school and high school. You know, you kind of just have your good friends. In college, you have your really close friends, the ones that you talk to daily and, you know, you hang out with. And those who don't like you, it's fine. That's, that's okay. And here I am now. I'm just 25. I, I don't really concern myself with those who may like me or may not like me, but there is one person that if he were to tell me that we were, he did not love me or we were in anything in any sort of way, it literally would break my heart. And it would be my father. It would be my dad. My dad is literally the most important person to me on this earth. And he's the hardest working man that I know. He's the example that I hope to live, the earthly example I hope to live up to. And I talk about him a lot. You guys have heard me talk about him a lot. And it's the one person that would break my heart if he just said, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm choking myself. You know what, son? Uh, I don't love you anymore. I would laugh about it. Like, I have funny dad. No, I'm serious. I don't love you anymore. You're a Falcons fan. You, 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 you live in the beautiful state of Florida, and I'm stuck here in Georgia. And no, I just want to disown you. I don't love you anymore. Hang up. That would break my heart. Joking or not, it would break my heart. Because I, I wouldn't have fellowship with the person that I love dearly, the person who's raised me for the past 25 years. Uh, I wouldn't have fellowship. I wouldn't be able to call him. I wouldn't be able to go home on Christmas to see him. That fellowship would be gone. Is he still my father? Of course. I kind of don't have a choice about that. But at the end of the day, that would just really hurt me. Let's say I actually did something. Say I stole $2 million just out of robbery, armed robbery. All of a sudden that's disappointed me. I disown you as my son, I don't wanna to talk to you. That would break my heart. 
because that fellowship with my father is gone. And just as much as that would break my heart, it should be the exact same when we quench the spirit and lose fellowship with God. It should be the exact same intensity. I personally don't know how long, how many nights I would go without sleeping had my dad been serious and said something like that. And if only we can have Christians that felt the exact same way when we hurt and displease our father with the sin in our own lives. But unfortunately, sometimes we, like I said, continue to do that sin and we get that heart in heart. Listen, Christian, fellowship away from God is not worth it in any regard. No matter what it is, no matter what you do, no matter who you hang out with, a fellowship with God is 100% worth it. And that beats anything else that this world can give you. Any other sin that you can fall into, any other thing that you can get out of sin. Relationship with God, a true, strong, actual, hardcore relationship with God is worth so much more than any other sin can actually offer. And that would be a result of a heart and heart. So how do we remedy it? Well, in verse 14, we'll look at this verse and I'll be done. I know it's really hot, so we'll wrap it up here. Verse number 14, the Bible says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Hold the beginning of our confidence. Our confidence is another word for the word that you and I would describe as faith. If we hold to the faith from the beginning, that beginning faith, which is salvation. Salvation in belief in who? Jesus Christ. And what he did on the cross. Essentially given the idea of holding to our first love, holding to that faith, that faith that you had when you first accepted Jesus Christ as you say when you recognize that nothing else in the world could be more true than Jesus dying on the cross for you. We have that faith and we exemplify that faith. Sin will have its fiery darts come at us and we will run to the Lord. We'll run to Jesus Christ. It will be a natural thing for us. Something where we see that if we look at God's word and God's word doesn't say it, then I can't do it. If God's word does say it or command it, then I will do it. And anything else will be out of the way. And Christian, may it be said of us in this room that we took sin seriously and because, that, because of that, we don't have that hard heart and we have that actual relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if you're unsaved, your heart is hard already because you haven't accepted the truth. You haven't accepted the fact that Jesus Christ has died for you. And the only way to remedy that is salvation itself. Recognizing that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin and paid that payment for you. But it doesn't end there. He rose again. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ rose again after three days. He rose again. And he's waiting for you. He has a place, or he has a place prepared for the Savior. He's waiting for you to come to him so that way you can receive him as your personal savior and have that particular faith. So, as we wrap this up, as we end this particular message, my prayer in my own personal life is that God would help me guard my heart as best as I can and that he would guard my heart as best as I can to prevent having that hardened, calloused, stone-filled heart that's immovable but rather a heart that's in his hands, in his care, and being able to be moved however he wills. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for tonight. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord, we had to look at your word. And I just pray to the Lord that you'll examine our hearts through God and help us to get a true diagnosis of where we are in our spiritual walk. And we will walk towards you, have a soft heart for you, and see others saved. We love you, we praise you, we ask this in your name. Alright, we will take prayer requests.